2020 has been a momentous year for science and global health. It sounds like a mind-bending problem. Increased understanding and awareness of the interconnections between humans and planet Earth has never been more pertinent. It feels magical here. And Irish research is helping drive us towards a brighter, better world. It's ingenious technology. This week on 10 Things to Know About, we're looking at biodiversity. Jonathan looks at the critical role of our bumblebees. Katrina meets the researchers using modern technology to monitor nature. And I reveal how centuries old plant samples can provide clues to changes in our biodiversity. Biodiversity is vital to all aspects of life on Earth. The intricate balance and interaction between every living organism on the planet is critical to the quality of food we eat, the water we drink and the air we breathe. Gaining detailed knowledge of this delicate relationship is central to preserving it. Biological diversity has made our planet habitable for billions of years. And now more than ever, we're realizing we need to understand and protect the biodiversity of our habitat, our species and our ecosystems in order to keep it that way. Colin Kelleher is a research botanist at the National Botanic Gardens of Ireland. Colin, you work in an absolutely beautiful place. I'm so jealous. But this part of the gardens looks very, very different to the rest of it. it. It is very different, but this is actually one of my favorite parts of the garden. It's uh, called Wild Ireland, and we're trying to recreate wild habitats here. And in fact, this is really where the biodiversity is. It's about the variation of life. So from genes up to species, up to habitats. And this as an example is a really good example in terms of it looks like a grassland really. Generally, in an improved grassland, you would have about two to four species. But in this, we have measured uh, up to 40 species wow. in one square meter. It just shows you the diversity that can exist out in the wild, as it were. The National Botanic Gardens was set up in 1795, and one of its main purposes was to study agriculture in a more scientific way. During the famine, the gardens was key to identifying the causes of the devastating potato blight. And today, research continues in many areas, including being a host to one of Ireland's five special phenological gardens, where researchers use plants to study environmental change. Phenology, so, would be the study of timing of biological events. It might seem like an obscure word, but everybody deals with it on a daily basis. Everybody uh, has to watch out for hay fever. That's Phenology, it's the timing of the release of the pollen. Bud burst, everybody's looking for the, the buds bursting in spring. Of course, farmers would be most attuned to it, but most people would notice the, the differences uh, in, in timing. And we can hear uh, birds singing here. Birds will respond to the timing of all these events. In the gardens, we have this tremendous record dating back over 200 years which is the herbarium. And in that, we can look at physical specimens captured 200 years ago. Here uh, in these compactors, this is the world collection. So of the 600,000, we have about uh, 200,000 in, in the world collection and then we have uh, a separate Irish collection. This is Robert Lloyd Prager back in uh, 1893 in Hoth, collecting a bramble. And there was a study done in 2012 to look at these brambles and see, could we uh, see changes in flowering time over the, the whole collection? One single specimen is nothing really, but then as you add multiples on top of it, you get something that's a little bit more statistically robust. And so we had researchers coming in and looking at hundreds of specimens, 
and we're then scoring each of these for the progression of the flower, essentially. So is it completely in bud versus completely out in fruit? And what was the trend that you found in comparing these plants from over 100 years ago to more recently? So they found essentially that uh, flowering time was earlier, uh, which Again, we know that it's in common uh, knowledge now that our springs are earlier and warmer, but this is a physical reference mm. to that. It's not just an imaginary, yes, we think it's getting warmer. These are the plants, yes, responding to environmental cues and changing their habit essentially. Ireland's phenology gardens are playing a key role in monitoring environmental change, but research is happening across the country to understand the layered complexities of what nature is telling us. Astrid Wingler is Head of Plant Science at University College Cork. Phenology is the science of biological seasonal events, so that may be the life cycle of an insect or the migration of a bird, or it may be de developmental events in plants such as flowering or the formation of leaves. And it's very important for us to know that this happens and when it happens because climate has an impact on these events. So by observing what's going on in nature, we can actually see climate change happening. But then it's also important for interactions between different organisms and for biodiversity. For example, if plants flower earlier, but the insects aren't active earlier, then there may be a mismatch. So there may be a mismatch between the life cycles of the plants and of the in insects. Yeah, because it's the whole interconnectedness of it that trees go, go at a certain time, then the insects come, then the birds come. Exactly. And if anything is out, then it could have a big effect on a population. Exactly. So we call that phenological mismatch when everything is out of sync. And it's kind of hard to believe that we're in the middle of UCC campus surrounded by all these trees, but these are actually part of your research project. Yeah. So these are native trees. So they were planted in 2013 and we're measuring the greenness of these trees by measuring chlorophyll contents. Chlorophyll is the green pigment in leaves and is vital for photosynthesis, when plants use sunlight to convert carbon dioxide and water into oxygen and the sugars that enable them to grow. What we are measuring is the process called leaf senescence. So this is what happens in autumn. This is what happens when the leaves turn yellow or sometimes they turn red as well. So we know a lot about spring phenology. So these are the processes such as the leaf formation in spring. So we know a lot about how that's influenced by climate change. But we know much less about autumn, the senescence, and that's because it's more difficult to quantify because it's a more gradual process. Okay, so this is how we do the chlorophyll fluorescence measurements. Astrid, this looks a bit like a clothes peg on a tree to me, but I'm sure it's a bit more sophisticated than that. So basically, that. it is just a clothes peg, a clothes pe peg with a shutter. I attach the machine, open the shutter, and then I do my measurement. You're pulsing a bit of light at the leaf. Exactly. So basically, what we're measuring is the chlorophyll fluorescence. And this is light emitted by chlorophyll, and it tells us something about the photosynthetic function of the leaf. So the number is 0.77. It's a bit below 0.8, and that indicates that already it's not no longer fully photosynthetically functional. You can see the leaf is starting to yellow a bit. Yeah, yeah. And so already getting into autumn senescence now at the beginning of September. We measure multiple leaves on multiple trees and then average these values. And then another thing that we want to do is relate the phenology of trees to the phenology of birds. Astrid's research colleague, Paul Holloway, has perhaps the most relaxing job in UCC. Paul, I hear you're studying phenology by actually listening to the birds sing. Yes, so instead of using cameras to take photographs of landscapes, we're using recorders to capture the soundscapes. So each environment has a distinct set of um, 
sounds associated with it. And what we're doing is we're trying to capture these sounds that can be linked to different phenological events, such as bird migration or the breeding season. So how do you go about doing that? We have these small recorders here that um, are very, very easy to use and, and quite inexpensive. If we're recording in the same location every day, we can begin to pinpoint when the migrants arrive through their bird song, also identify when we're having increased insect noise and insect activity, because obviously that's important too, because that's the, uh, the bird's food sources. We're recording something like 50 recordings per day over the year period. So we have short sound clips that we then plug in and try and identify what the different birds are and what the different insects are. And so we can identify when they're here, how long they're here and when they leave and then try and tie that to the weather data that we're collecting from Med Erin. It's still quite early to tell, but one of our graduate students has been analysing a lot of citizen science data alongside these recordings, and we're beginning to see an emergence of birds arriving earlier in the um, year, whereas insects appear to be much more varied um, and respond much more to the temperatures. And so the idea that the birds are coming earlier, not necessarily because of the temperatures here. Exactly, yes, uh, but, but the... more at a global level, yes. OK, yeah. and then obviously it's a problem if they get here and there's no insects here. Exactly. If we can use these models and use our statistical analysis to predict when these events are likely to happen, we can identify gaps in the food and we can hopefully get the public involved and say, well, we're expecting a shortage of food for certain species in these locations for the next coming weeks. We suggest maybe you could put out different food sources that would hopefully supplement the, the, the natural diet of these birds. Field research is the traditional approach, but advances in technology are enabling researchers to use satellite images to observe changes in nature. Fiona Cockwell is working with Astrid to provide a remote view of things. What we try and do with our satellite imagery is look much more at the tree canopy, so we're looking at the tops of the trees, which doesn't give us the same amount of detail, but allows us to look at many, many more trees. And what are you actually looking at? What are you looking for? What we are trying to record is how green that tree canopy is and how that changes through the course of the year. One of the challenges that we have here in Ireland in particular is the amount of cloud cover we have. We can only use our satellite data when we've got clear skies. We take all those cloud-free images and we calculate that green curve over the course of the year. As well as collecting field data, the UCC research team recently set up a phenocam on site that takes photos of the same tree every day. They can then use these photos to compare and validate the corresponding satellite imagery from the European Space Agency, which captures visible and near-infrared images of the Earth's surface. Crucially, the team can then apply this knowledge to historical satellite data and assess vegetation trends over time. The three lines there are representing the three years 2017 through to 2019. And the green line is 2019, which is a more or less normal year in terms of weather events. But if we look in more detail in 2017, we can see it actually peaked higher in the summer because it was a cool, wet summer, ideal for the native vegetation, such as oak trees that grow in Ireland. And then we can see here this very rapid drop off yes. in October, which followed ex hurricane Ophelia when a lot of the leaves came off the trees. We can see how a particular weather event has a lasting impact on the vegetation for maybe weeks or months afterwards, which of course links into the biodiversity. Where I'd like to see this going is to have a better understanding of a few select points around the country from the phenocams and then use that to inform our interpretation and understanding of the satellite imagery. With the aspiration of kind of informing policy in terms of forestry or climate adaptability or that kind of thing? Absolutely, yes. So to be able to understand more about things like the carbon budget of the country, which is very important, the government have to report a national inventory on the amount of carbon that is taken out of the atmosphere and released into the atmosphere each year. The more information we have on things like the growing season for different species can inform how much carbon those trees are taking out of the atmosphere. 
At the moment, there's a lot of you know, good guesswork going on, and we need to be able to refine some of that guesswork to be a lot more specific. In the beauty of biodiversity, the important role of some animals can sometimes be, shall we say, underappreciated. Take, for instance, the vulture. You see, for all their perceived ugliness, the hunched, naked necks tearing flesh from bone, the circling funds waiting to buy up distressed assets, vultures are the good guys in India's biodiversity balancing act, taking on the unsavory job of efficiently getting rid of rotting cattle carcasses in a country with a huge amount of agriculture. However, this delicate balance was thrown into disarray in the 1990s, when the huge vulture population crashed without warning in what became a textbook lesson in the law of unintended consequences. The absence of vultures set off a chain reaction that went all the way to the top of the food chain, to us. Cattle carcasses lay rotting across India, and with no competition, feral dogs then feasted and multiplied, culminating in an explosion of rabies deaths in humans from dog bites. In fact, so quick was the tipping point that it took scientists years to figure out exactly what had happened. The culprit? A simple anti-inflammatory drug that farmers had begun to use to effectively treat fever in cattle. While transformative on the farm, it proved lethal to vultures, eating fresh meat containing the drug, which quickly caused kidney failure and is thankfully now banned. In the complex world of interaction between species, the vulture's circling of death is in fact the very delicate circle of life. See you next time. When we talk about protecting biodiversity, it's fair to say that for many of us, the first thing that comes to mind is the bee. Four out of five wild bees are bumblebees, and these furry little creatures are vital pollinators for our crops and wildflowers. I've come to the wildflower meadow in Maynooth University to meet researcher Sarah Larrakee. Bumblebees and other bees are incredibly important in regulating ecosystems, so they play a key role in plant reproduction. They are also important for crop pollination, so they're very important for our health and our economy. People like to put a monetary value on pollination services, and in Ireland at the moment, it's valued at about 59 million euros per year. At a global scale, this goes up to 260 billion to 1 trillion euros per year. There are 99 bee species in Ireland, and of those, 21 are species of bumblebee. If we have so many different species of bees, then why are we importing bees? Because we're doing that in their droves, aren't we? Yeah, a lot of horticultural growers in Ireland actually import boxes of bumblebees to pollinate crops like strawberries and apples. And the reason why horticultural growers like bumblebees so much is that they can deal with Irish climate, and so our cooler, wetter conditions, which we get a lot of. And they're also, they have the ability to buzz pollinate. When they're visiting a flower, they buzz at a particular frequency, which releases the pollen from that flower. The pollen then gets on their body, they travel to the next flower, and then pollination happens. Ireland imports around 2,000 bee colonies every year to aid pollination of crops. Bombus terrestris, the organism that I study, is one of these species that is brought into Ireland. And is there a problem with importing all of these bees here? Yes, they can actually spread pathogens to our wild bees, so not just our native populations of Bombus terrestris, but actually all species of our bees here in Ireland. They can compete as well with our native bees for food resources, for nesting sites. And they can also, if they are allowed to escape, they can cross mate with our native populations of Bombus terrestris. And what could happen there is you lose perhaps some advantageous genes in this population that help the Irish bees deal with Irish weather, Irish uh, ecosystems, Irish crops. 
My research is really about evaluating our Irish population of the buff-tailed bumblebee Bombus terrestris. What we want to do is evaluate this species from the DNA level all the way up to its behaviour level. So we want to understand, is there anything unique about this population in its DNA code? How does that manifest in its behaviour or its immune responses to things like pathogens? How does its detoxifying system respond to pesticides? So we want to understand if we have a genetic resource here in Ireland that we need to preserve and protect from potential risks such as importation of commercial bumblebees. Has the bumblebee genome been sequenced? Bombus terrestris has been sequenced, but what we plan on doing is sequencing the Irish population of Bombus terrestris. So what we'll be doing is actually the first whole genome-wide evaluation of an Irish species of bumblebee. So, Sarah, these are your bees. These are the bees. So I've got four queens in here, and I also have some male bees. So the queen is that big so you lady have a big over there. Queen over here. They're huge. Yeah. Here you have a male that's trying to mate with the queen. These matings can actually last from 15 minutes up to an hour. Wow. Yeah. So it's quite a long process. Good on you, bees. My aim is to find a way to protect our native biodiversity while also getting the important pollination services that these commercial bumblebees provide us. So we all need food, we all need to eat, but we also need to protect our wonderful wildlife because if we lose it, we're not going to get it back again. One third of our bee species are threatened with extinction, so protecting them is a key priority. Changes to landscapes and wildflower areas has contributed to habitat loss and food shortages, while the use of pesticides may damage the immune systems of bees and how they pollinate. And of course, climate change is also a significant factor. Jim Carolyn is a biology lecturer at Maynooth University. So what can we do to protect the pollinators of Ireland? Well, there are many initiatives that are ongoing to try and sort of, you know, put, put protections in place for our native pollinators. One of the main initiatives is the All Ireland Pollinator Plan. And what this plan does is it sort of gives guidelines to different sectors, like schools, county councils, farms, college campuses like we have here. And it gives us sets of steps that we can follow that can actually sort of promote areas of biodiversity on our campuses and on, and on our land. Years ago, we would have sort of wanted our areas to be sort of lush green lawns that were highly manicured, but these are green deserts for our pollinators. Whereas now we're now converting these areas into wildflower meadows. What about gardens then, uh, people watching at home? Should they be moving away from lawns and, and giving a space for bees in their gardens? Absolutely. So the best way to help our pollinators is to actually do nothing. So leave a little bit of area to grow wild and to mow our lawns less. So by doing this, we provide dandelions and clover for our, particularly our bumblebees and pollinating insects to actually feed on. Are you hopeful about the future for Ireland's bees and Ireland's pollinators? I am indeed, but us scientists, we're, we're hopeful optimistic lot. I know the world is sort of facing lots of problems these days with sort of climate change, the COVID pandemic and the loss of wildlife and, and biodiversity. But it's really essential that we don't give up hope. As scientists, we have to continue our research, but as members of the public, we have to know that even small changes can make a big difference. That's our 10 things to know about biodiversity. Next week, we're sniffing out the science of taste.